Sitting here with me is Sam Burko, infamous guy that I've known for quite a long time. We've had some interesting adventures together. We've years. had some adventures. And Sam, tell us a little bit about all the wonderful things you've done. When the Wizard of Oz does? Yeah. Wow. Uh, besides being the man behind the curtain. I thought um, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> you were the man behind the curtain. Uh, I think we both hit behind that curtain at various times. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's probably true. So, Sam, yes, you started professional career as a consultant? Yeah, I started out as a bad musician and realized that I enjoyed mixing. Very, very quickly realized that I didn't want to live on a tour bus. I was grounded in engineering and technology, but I didn't really like not being around musicians and music. So I found acoustics as a way to mix engineering and my interest in design and, and a scientific engineering approach to things. And acoustics, the aesthetic, the psychological, um, really mixed for me. I had a moment, one of those epiphany moments when a friend of mine was building a recording studio, asked me to help, and it wasn't sounding right. I was literally under the console with a voltmeter trying to figure out signals and gain structure. And I went to the library and there really wasn't very many good references that were practical. What time period? This was 1985, 86. Yeah. I called someone who knew someone who knew someone and got an introduction to Russell Johnson at Artec. And he told me to go back to school and study, get a master's degree in acoustics. And where did you go? Uh, I went to Stevens Institute of Technology because they had an anechoic chamber that was being unused. There weren't a ton of acoustics programs. A Penn it's not State, like today. I mean, not yeah. that I'm saying today. Is that... There were always some people, yeah. but it was very niche. And I wanted to... Uh, work at Artec, or at least intern at Artec, or do something with Russell. Stevens had their courses in the evening, so I started basically working with Russell and researching double volume or coupled volume spaces. During that time, I met the folks at Bell Labs and the folks from Ario and the folks from Lexicon. Everything just steamrolled from there. You once called my path circuitous. I used a big word like that? Yes, you did. Well, I must have been, before I killed a lot more brain cells after that. <laughs> I think the first time I met you, standing in, as I recall, and I, we may have had brushes mm -hmm. with Infamy, but I remember standing in a line at an AES show waiting to register. We started talking. I you, met you before was, that, but that, okay. that was the first time we like. But yeah, but I remember, you know, walking away from that saying, well, this guy's either nuts or really bright. <laughs> <laughs> and it was nuts. <laughs> well, it was both. <laughs> it was both. <laughs> what was the name of the company that, while well, you, I think, were Joyner Rose, you did? Yes, there was a company called Hypersignal. That's it. Right. That's where and, you, you said you were yes, from. I, I was still at Joyner Rose. Joyner Rose Group had a, a great group of consultants. And what's really interesting is when you look and you wanted to talk about the history of the acoustics and audio world, there are certain pods that happened. Uh, in acoustics, the folks at Bulk, Baranek, and Newman right. were one of those Centenic pods where, yeah, thing. Ted Schultz was there and obviously Leo Baranek and a whole slew of other great acoustics people. There were people at McEwen Sound, right. John I, Myers. We've identified that in a, right. with Joe and Greg who worked at McEwen right. Sound. Right. And, so, and yeah, Abbasi so like Thorny was yeah. there and John Meyer was there and Steve Kadar and the guys from Apogee. Yeah. And um, so uh, Jordan Rose Group was another one of those things where you had Jack Wrightson and his crew and Russ Berger and his crew and uh, Rich Zweibel, who invented Media Matrix. Right. Um, we actually shared an office for a while. And Rich had an amazing insight that the drawings we were doing as consultants, the, the flow diagrams, were in fact the product. He was really the person responsible for envisioning very early on the idea that you, once you drew it, that was it. Like, it was just have a computer figure right. out the routing. That was a very deep insight, actually. There were a lot oh, of people- kind of the virtualization. Of, the virtualization. Of the world. Right. I think that we had a lot of creative people and people who are still in this industry. It's amazing. This is now 35 years so later. Craig was there. Craig Jansen was there. Was, uh, Ron Baker and Gary White. Oh, so Was many. Topper there? He Topper was, was there, yes. Was there. You had this amazing group of people who all went on to stay in the audio acoustics design industries. And we all worked together. When that group sort of fell apart, Russ Berger left. And then when Jack left to start WJHW, they didn't have money to hire me. And 
I wasn't sure if I was going to stay in Dallas anyway. I figured I'd move back to New York. I decided to take a year or two and try and develop an acoustic measurement system. I had been working with the guys on HyperSignal, and I had talked. So back up. To, to, let's not go down that right, quite right. yet, because I think that's an interesting story. Right. I want to HyperSignal. Um, it was just two guys, virtual DSP. Their idea was you would draw these blocks and string them together, and then it would generate the code for your DSP. The same way sound systems had been virtualized. DSP development would be virtualized. People had so many problems with DSP development in those days. It was much harder than it is today. Much, much, much yeah, harder. People don't understand that there's this progression from, you know, weird science to rocket science to uh, cookbooky, but you got to put the glue together to it's simple. Right. And, and everything tends to go through that progression. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's actually true. It, it's, it's so amazing. There was a guy in a company called Ariel. Right. And you know, incredibly smart guys over there at Bell Labs. And they were super nice to me. And I said, hey, you don't know me, but I'm interested in these DSP boards. The reason that this tied in so well is that he was developing boards for people to develop programs. You put a $3,000 board in your $3,000 PC and you could have a DSP and you could run audio in and out and you right. could test it. Ariel was one of those companies that made a board for every chip. It's like Motorola. Right, Motorola or Texas Instruments yeah. and whichever version and with different memory models. And you could program your DSP on these cards. They had ported a, an acoustic measurement system. It was a swept chirp, a swept sine wave system. Like a Melissa called. kind of. It, no, Melissa's noise. Melissa's pseudo random yeah, yeah, noise. Yeah. The system that was measuring, I was interested in using. So through the people at Artec and the people at uh, at Ariel, I was able to meet the folks at Bell Labs who were incredibly supportive and friendly and helped. And Tony, after meeting me, just let me borrow a couple of boards. He just gave them to me. I, I remember riding the subway home because they were in Soho and they moved to New Jersey. I had two or three of these $3,000 boards on the subway. If I lose these, I'm bankrupt. Uh, I started thinking about measurement, FFTs and analysis and really trying to study it. At the same time, I was spending a lot of time talking to Don Pearson about what made the sound systems at ultrasound different than the other sound systems I was hearing. And he was he using SIM at that point? No, SIM didn't exist at that point. This no. is pre-SIM. What, what year? 86. Well, that's early. I read a bunch of people, a bunch of letters, because there wasn't email. <laughs> Think about how old that makes me feel. But I wrote to you, David You Grissinger. chiseled him in stone. Right. I, or no, you papyrus. Papyrus and, and, and feather quill. Yeah. Right. I, I sent a letter to David Grissinger asking uh, what the correlation. I said, you know, your, the PCM70 had just come out. And it sounded very natural. It sounded So I wrote, Dear David, what is the relationship between your algorithms and architecture? And he wrote, Dear Sam, none, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's an incredibly smart guy. I mean, unbelievably smart guy. And he went on and we, we started a conversation that went on for about 20 years about how to measure room acoustics. And Was he involved in the Lars? No, he developed a, a method we called thwapping, which was a way to measure rooms and get a long impulse by using a signal made from bucket brigading all pass filters. Yeah, you took an all pass filter and you ran it out through an all pass, through another all pass, through another all pass. You took the signal you got out of that, you flipped it around, and if you ran it back through the same filters that created it, you got back your original impulse. So if you played that impulse through a room and then ran it through the filters, you know, the reverse order, you'd get the impulse response of the room. And I was fascinated by this because before that, we had been using a GUB, a guy named John Bradley at the uh, Canadian Research Institute had cut the barrel off a handgun and figured out a little baffle. And we paid some guy in Texas to make us blanks. There was no bullet, it was just a, yeah. a blank that had the same number of exact grains of gunpowder, he could measure it that yeah, yeah. precisely. And the idea was you'd sit there on the stage and blow off a gun and record it, and that would be your impulse. Of course, it wasn't very accurate, and it wasn't very, um, because it had so much turbulence because of the high output, it wasn't really, a, and then we'd burst balloons. And finally, we just- so you just try to find a signal source that would give you a good impulse. impulse. Right. Yeah. 
And so you wouldn't think that would be that hard. <laughs> it's pretty hard. <laughs> you know, the thing about an impulse is that it goes up, but it never goes down past zero. So right. it's like inertia, you know, in the world of all types uh, is the enemy of the impulse. Yeah. So um, we measured a few halls though that way. And then things like Melissa and... Um, so when did TEF come about? Was that... TEF was around at that time. That was, I'm trying to, I'll that have to go a, back and look. The, 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 right. The problem I had with TEF, and that's how I met David Andrews. Someone told me he owned a TEF machine. And so I literally came to a shop. I said, can you tell me about the measurements you make with this TEF machine you, you bought? And he said, call Larry at Techron. And I called Larry at Techron. And he's like, if you're not going to buy one, why am I wasting my time talking to you? And I'm like, well, I'm trying to understand it. And I went uh, to a seminar someone was teaching on TEF that, that Techron was sponsoring. And he showed a waterfall plot, and I was completely lost. And I went to 10 or 12 people. I said, can someone explain this to me? And no one seemed to really understand it. You should have talked to me. Yeah. Because we were doing waterfall plots. Right. Back, that well, it was wasn't the, the waterfall plot. It was the tracking filters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the but, whole... but we were doing, but you didn't need to do that. We were doing that with uh, IQS in right. 84. Right. But that was like uh, crazy stuff. And you didn't know what to look, do with it once right. you had all that data. Right. The, the problem was that you couldn't do really long FFTs. And this is, this is the key thing. It's funny. One of the most famous sound systems of all times is the wall of sound. People talk about it in all these different ways. Very few people know what Owsley and those guys were trying to do. There was one specific goal of this system. The goal of the wall of sound was to eliminate monitor. That everyone in the band was hearing everyone else in the band from surrounding the speakers behind them. And it was a distribution of audio systems. So all the sound was moving in one direction. It was, no monitors on the floor. And the idea was that it would clean up the audio for everybody and reduce feedback needs and just allow, especially with that big center vocal cluster, localization of vocals. And um, and just to be clear, multiple systems. Right. It's, it's, there was a different system for the bass guitar, the guitar, that's right. the keyboard, well, vocals. Right. They, they literally matrixed loudspeakers, right. if you want to think so, of it that way. Intermodulation distortion. There were all these things that you solved right. by having... You know, you create all these other issues. Issues, right. Of course, you always do, but, you know. Anyway, acoustic measurement was being driven by hardware, people selling hardware, and the software wasn't helping. The question of how to analyze a loud, uh, loudspeaker system in an actual room and get it ready for a show was not something that I felt like the TEF system was able to do. And they would say, well, you can't measure low frequencies in a room and you can't do this, you can't do that. And what I came to realize, I wanted to study this idea of a coupled room decay. In concert halls that Russell is designing, uh, the first one didn't work, believe it or not, which was at Penn State, Eisenhower Auditorium, still there, and the chambers don't really do very much. The room was much too wide, the opening's too small. So we developed a mathematical model of coupled rooms. And it turned out to be interesting. The question was, how do you measure decays for four or five seconds over a broadband uh, analysis accurately? And it was really uh, a big challenge. We really struggled with it. And David Grisinger had this thwapping technique, and we tried the balloons, but we weren't really getting what we wanted. I looked and talked to the TEF people. They thought that frequency bandwidth, you had to limit it to go long. So if you wanted to make a four or five second measurement, it would be you know a third of an octave wide or half an octave wide because the sweep had to go through those things slowly, that, that range. I, I wasn't convinced that was true. I, I kept looking for solutions and the SIM system came out and they were making measurements where at low frequencies they were using very long time windows and the time windows got shorter and shorter. Then, the top frequencies, you were only seeing the loudspeaker. You weren't seeing the interaction of the room. And that mimics very closely the experience that humans have, uh, the way we hear. Our ears react very quickly to high frequency sounds and mid frequency sounds because the wavelengths are very short. And you can get a bunch of wavelengths in a very short period of time. At low frequencies, it takes your ear a long time to sort of localize the sound and figure out where it is and what it is. If you ever do. If you ever do. <laughs> and that's why so and many... room things become... Very bizarre. Crazy. And modeling, it's very hard. 
So I came up with some ideas about that. And we started thinking about that. That's when I started thinking about taking hyper signal and modifying it to make acoustic measurements because these guys had all these building blocks. Their company fell apart. They split into two companies and I tried to buy one of them. Put an ungodly effort into making this deal happen. The day before we're supposed to close, the guy who was the programmer came back to me and said, I need assurances of this, that, and the other thing. And I was incredulous. I was really disappointed. I put so much work into you know, their product and a business plan and raising money. And I was ready to go. I went to a friend who, go ahead, just start your own company. Just build the damn thing. We've reached a good breaking point to end part one of my talk with Sam Burko. In part two, I'll be talking to Sam about the developments of SMART, the breakthrough native PC dual-channel FFT analysis system that's become the industry standard for measurement and alignment of live touring sound systems. We're excited to be working with Sam on a future series of educational videos. We plan on covering measurement techniques along with how-to topics like real-world recording acoustics. Please tell us what you'd like to see us explore in the YouTube comments section below. I want to thank Sam for helping the team create some truly inspiring content for About Pro Sound and for putting up with my video production learning curve. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button below and use the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss part two when Sam talks about the development of SMART along with all the other content coming in 2021. Masking up, which people should do whenever appropriate, I believe strongly. Hi everyone, Sam Burko here with Ken Berger. Ken Berger. We made a video and during that, there's a discussion of the wall of sound, a brief discussion. I'd like to say to everyone, if you want to argue and say that our comments were wrong, please send your letters to anyone but me. Information we presented came from Bear. He said it to me. That's it. It's one of those topics that there's a lot of people have a lot of opinions and ideas. and A lot know. of great people involved in that system. It was amazing. We used it as an example and talked about it. I am dreading the emails coming. It's an emotional attachment that people have. The guys who built that thing were amazing. It was an amazing system. And I think the goal that Bear told me was the overriding concern, removing monitors. That was an amazingly brilliant insight. And if you don't think that was a major concern or a major driving goal, feel free yeah. to tell anyone other than me. I, I always look at that system. Those guys were trying stuff that people have sort of thought about, talked about, but no one actually did on the scale that they did. Right. And I'm sure there was a lot of knowledge right. on all different things and stuff that wasn't even intended. Right. And just to emphasize my great love and respect for Bear, I'm wearing my Dancing Bear COVID mask. So wear a mask, be safe, have fun, talk about audio, and please don't send upset emails about comments in the wall of sound to me. Don't send them to me either because he made them. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody.